welcome everyone um, to our, I guess, like casual discussion oh. workshop. Um, it's, yeah, again, like it's more like a casual talking about things. It's not going to be like any hardcore coding session. Um, we'll briefly introduce you to a couple of things we do. Um, we at O1 Labs, we incubated MENA protocol, um, which is a blockchain with CK built in mind. We are working actively on O1.js, which is the thing that allows you to write zero-knowledge smart contracts on MENA and also off-chain peer-to-peer applications. Um, we are also doing work on the optimism fault-proving stack by proving the fault-proof in CK, which is pretty fancy. And yeah, so my name is Florian. I do engineering working on O1.js, which is our TypeScript SDK and Nathan over there. Um, he is a protocol architect working on the protocol. So I'll briefly give you a quick introduction overview about the application development side and Nathan will then go into, I guess, a bit more about the, the protocol. What do you need to like make the thing work on the protocol because these things are like also very important. Um, people always like to like look at them from the application perspective, but there's a lot of stuff below that's very important. So yeah. Um, the entire theme is about building systems and, and DLS, these DLS um, for decentralized, scalable compute applications. And if we just like look at basic or traditional blockchains like Ethereum, excuse my handwriting, I hope you can, can read that. Um, if you look at the execution model from like Ethereum or other traditional blockchains, we can we all know that they're like on-chain executed. Right, so on-chain actually means we do have a user um, which is sitting somewhere at home with their ledger, with their MetaMask, browser wallet, whatever. And whenever they want to interact with the network, they simply create a transaction. Um, and the transaction includes a payload saying, hey, I want to interact with this smart contract at this um, address. I want to invoke a certain method giving you like a payload, let's say my inputs. Um, and then like tell the network, please go and compute the thing. So we have a network of like Ethereum nodes, um, which are <clears throat> quite, which is quite a large network. And all these nodes, what they do with the original transaction payload is they do all the computation um, one by one to verify that the compu computation is correct and that the transaction was successful. So that is pretty inefficient, I would say. Um, if every network, if every node on the network needs to do some sort of computation every time a user interwokes a smart contract. So that is sort of like O of N complexity with like, I guess, N being the, the number of nodes in the network, roughly. So yeah, if we like look at a couple of benefits and like disadvantages of like this system. So couple benefits, what do we have? We have like data integrity and computational integrity. Why do we have that? Um, every node is sort of like computing our payload. Um, they are each checking the correctness of the output and we do sort of like um, have con integrity with that. We can make sure that the input actually did result in the expected output because everyone ran the computation. That is a Relatively obvious, straightforward thing. If I give you a payload, you do the computation. I do the computation myself, the same payload. We can simply compare the output, um, and then we will know that both values are the same and both parties did the correct computation. Um, however, that also has a couple of disadvantages. Um, it is inefficient. And with inefficiency also comes um, Expensive. It's it's expensive. You have to pay the network, or you have to pay the, your your um, fellow party like some fee, some sort of like computational gas fee to do the computation, and that is you know not necessarily the most efficient way. So, what alternatives are they? If we look at this computational model, we have a user and we have a network. Um, how can we make that more efficient and more cheaper as well? Quite simple, actually. We simply take the computation and do it off-chain. So, oh, see. so rather than um, doing the computation on-chain, we do have a user again, and we do have a network of nodes um, on the blockchain. 
And instead of sending a transaction with the payload, we simply send a transaction um, with a proof of the transaction to the network. The proof will be generated by the user and then simply verified by all nodes on the network, which is a much more cheaper and efficient way to do sort of like um, a test to the correctness of the transaction and that I guess, even though not necessarily correct, that's like oh, one constant sort of like only verifying a very succinct proof, which is quite efficient, very fast and very cheap. Um, and that's how the entire theme, I guess, of MENA and O1JS fits into, and that's what we enable you to do. Um, yeah, so the user, do they, they, they do the computation themselves, rather than dedicating computation to a network, they run the computation themselves, and that has a couple of benefits again, um, which are very interesting to look at it from a blockchain perspective. We can tap into unlimited computation, um, simply because we are not constrained by on-chain constraints, like we are not constrained by the amount of nodes that are on-chain, we are not constrained by the gas price and stuff like that. We can simply, as the user, do all the computation off-chain, generate a proof of it, and only send a very succinct proof to the network, which is very efficient and very cheap. Um, there's other benefits that come with that entire off-chain computational system, which is privacy. So with the um, system from before, where the network does the computation in order for the network to do the computation, they need access to the inputs, to the inputs to the method. And whenever I give you the inputs to my computation, you can look at them and you can make assumptions about them. Um, that's not very private. However, when we do off-chain computation and the user generates the proofs themselves locally, they have access to the inputs, to the private inputs, but they, the, the inputs never leave their PC. So we can use all sorts of inputs, we keep them private and only um, publish the, the, the final result of the computation, which makes it also very friendly to, to um, and private applications. So yeah, if we look at this entire concept from a more abstract point of view, um, we, we can just consider that the network being one part of the entire system, not the biggest part, and every user sort of would become a co-processor. So um, to give you a bit more of background, a co-processor is simply a, a processor which is sitting in your PC and it's doing a very dedicated piece of work. It's very good at that and it's also very efficient at that. So with off-chain computation, every user would do the, the piece of work that they needed themselves and only send a proof to the on-chain verifier to verify the correctness of it. So with that system, we can build a pretty interesting big network of like off-chain computation and co-processor um, systems. Essentially what the user does is substitute the on-chain blockchain, the network, with off-chain computation in a very secure way. So, however, that is only a quick introduction. Um, there's an entire thing which, which is quite important to that. That is the CKDSL. The CKDSL is the thing that users um, actually want to use to write these applications. So it's like your solidity, but for off-chain applications. And how do we um, design that thing? We have a couple of requirements. If we want to do computation off-chain, um, what are some requirements, for example? It needs to be like easy to use. So if we want to build a big system of off-chain computation of a network of CK coprocessors, we can't give people, I guess, only assembly and expect them to write their entire application example, uh, assembly. So it needs to be like easy to use. Um, it needs to be easy to integrate into existing um, systems, frameworks, especially Web2 browsers and stuff like that, but also easy to integrate into the server with Node.js and things like that. And it needs to have easy and understandable abstractions to build applications. And what can be used for that? Um, for example, TypeScript. Um, that's the thing we went for, which we think is quite an interesting um, sort of like host language for our embedded CK DSL. Um, however, only using TypeScript doesn't solve all the problems. 
So there's a couple of challenges we want to solve and that we want to improve. Um, number one being CK is quite a foreign concept. So if any one of you built a CK application before, even though it's still like, you know, brought to you by all sorts of like um, libraries and toolkits, it's still a pretty foreign concept. You need to think about it quite differently. Um, that can be a big hurdle for like Web2 developers, developers just getting into CK who don't even know a lot of blockchain. So we need to sort of like build easy abstractions. That's like a very big thing um, that we need to, to implement in our host language TypeScript, just simply making it easier for developers to build their applications. Um, yeah, so how do we do that? Um, it's actually quite an interesting concept. We simply pick up familiar TypeScript patterns and make them sort of like CK compatible. We simply use TypeScript, um, factory patterns or design patterns, behavior patterns, and simply enable them through a library to build business applications, smart contracts with them. So yeah, um, that sort of like results in a host language like TypeScript, which gives you the tools to build CK DSL-like applications simply in the browser, on the server, with like familiar concepts. Um, one of these concepts is actions and reducers. So if any one of you has used um, Redux before, Redux is sort of like a front end state management system, and Redux uses a um, actions and reducers um, to, manage, to manage state updates. So actions are, you can think of them like events. You simply like dispatch an event, you emit an event, and reduces are sort of like a function that describes how you want to go through the list of events and simply reduce them into a final state update. So with CK and off-chain computation, we have a, we introduce a, plop, a problem that sort of like introduces race conditions for concurrent um, state updates on shared state. The problem is if two people update the same state at the same point, one transaction will go through, the other transaction will fail, and we sort of like have state uh, race conditions with that. Um, using this like familiar TypeScript Web2 framework pattern like actions reduces, what we can do, instead of updating state directly, we can simply emit transactions and then later on go through the list and reduce them. So that is one example of using familiar Web2 language framework patterns to build application specific languages for developers. Um, one more thing that I want to mention, which is quite interesting, is recursion. In order to build a, a network of off-chain CK coprocessors, all of them need to, to interact with each other. Let's say you have an application running in the browser, your friend has an application running in the browser, and you simply want to connect them with each other. Um, how do you do that? In a trustless way, the, the answer is CK and recursion. So recursion, there's, like I like to see it, two steps, sort of like two ways of recursion. Number one being more a, a linear um, recursion where you have a proof, and the proof becomes input into another proof, and the, that proof verifies the previous proofs and the correctness, and you can simply keep going um, in a, I guess, linear line. Um, that's also how Mina works, um, reducing blocks and transactions into a linear sort of like state and only keeping the, the most up-to-date proof and verifying the, the correctness of, this, of the chain. Then there's a, a second thing, sort of like tree-like recursion, um, which enables you to re reduce a binary tree of proofs. Um, you can simply think of it literally as a binary tree where there's two proofs at the bottom, proof A and B, and both proofs can be recursively verified into another proof. And using this sort of like recursion system, we can build a sort of like peer-to-peer -peer, um, CK coprocessor DSL. So yeah, um, just gonna briefly show you how that looks like in O1.js, just showing you guys some code, so everything is a bit more familiar. Perfect. So yeah, 
Um, I mentioned earlier, it's the thing we are using over on JS is simply TypeScript. It's a TypeScript DSL. Um, it is not a TypeScript-like DSL, it is literally TypeScript, and with all these, I guess, features of TypeScript, we also have familiar patterns and things like that. So if we look at an example smart contract, um, we simply extend the smart contract, we have access to unchained state, and we can also update, um, add methods to it, we can generate proofs of these methods, and that's how we achieve the, I guess, application developer friendly environment. There's another thing I wanted to show is the CK program API. That's the thing I talked about just a second ago. Um, it's this concept of like recursion. We have either a linear recursion, which we also call inductive case, which takes a, a proof as private input, simply verifies that proof and generates a new proof of the correctness of the previous proof. And we can also build like tree-like state reduction proofs where we also always have binary trees, we reduce them, and yeah, just giving you a quick overview of how we do it in ONGS, um, how you can build these applications and how easy it is to build decentralized off-chain CK coprocessors that each do sort of like slightly different things, but you can combine them using recursion into a powerful network and eventually settle the nomina. So yeah. That's just a brief introduction from the application developer side. Um, Nathan will talk about the, the protocol. And yeah, are there any questions so far about the application side of things? Anything you want to talk about now? Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. We do have custom types in, in our DSL, in O1.js. Um, here we have field, field, which is the basic unit of sort of like CK programming, it's a finite field. Um, all computation that you do on the field, let's say field of five dot at five dot assert equals, whatever, that will generate constraints. So if you use the types that we provide you in O1.js, and use them and compose them, you will eventually end up with constraints. Um, however, if you use basic um, JavaScript notation with like just numeral literals, you will not generate constraints. So if you use the stuff that we provide in the, in the libraries, like field elements, um, we have group elements, we have signatures, um, we have structures which are more composite data types, all these things will generate constraints. Awesome. Yeah. Can Okay, so I'm gonna talk a bit about how all this actually works at the protocol level and also how at the protocol level, we take advantage of some of these features of having this off-chain compute to actually make some unique blockchain properties. Um, where is the eraser? Okay. Um, so basically, the way that Mina works is that for every single block that we have on the chain, there is also a proof paired to that block, which is attesting to the validity of that block, as well as every prior block and every transaction that's been included in every prior block. Um, in this sense, it's sort of like a, a constant roll-up that's happening on chain. Um, and so what that means is that at any point in time in the blockchain, it always takes O of one to verify every single computation that's ever happened on the chain, all these off-chain compute that we've done, that we've submitted proofs of verification to to the chain, um, we just do O of one to check every single one of those proofs. Um, and so the way that works is if you think about what it means to actually extend a block, right, a, a block is just encoding a state transition as a series of transactions, right? So we have a whole bunch of transactions that we're including into a block, and if we apply all of those TXNs to the, to the uh, ledger, 
then we're going to get a new ledger, and so the block is just representing the state transition. Um, and so to generate a new proof of the next block, essentially what we're doing is we're proving that the previous proof for the last block was valid. We're proving that the actual transition between the two blocks was valid, and then we're proving that all these transactions here are also valid, okay? And so this is basically the statement that we're encapsulating. Once we've proven all these transactions, we can then include that into a blockchain proof, and we've shown that all those transactions are correct, and then we still have that OAB1 verification for everything that's happened in the ledger. Um, and so we're left with just one succinct proof that's generated with every block, and this proof contains a proof of consensus, saying that the block was produced according to consensus rules. Um, it contains the proof of the transaction state transition and all the off-chain proofs that were included inside transactions that people submitted to the network. Um, and so to break this down a little more, like what is actually in a transaction, I'll just move to the other board so I don't have to keep on racing. Um, the breakdown of a transaction in MENA is that if you have a transaction, a transaction is basically a series of account updates. So you have a list of updates. Each update is applying to a single account in the ledger at any point in time. Um, and each update basically looks like this. So if I have an update, that update is comprised of two primary components. There's some other stuff in there too, but we'll just talk about these, which is preconditions and the actual like state updates that are gonna happen inside that account. So like if we're updating on-chain state, if we're modifying the balance of a transaction, this is basically the makeup of, of a single update within each transaction. Um, and what we can also provide is a ZK app proof, which is a testing to all this information. Um, so this proof that we have down here, the public input of this proof is this data. The public input is the preconditions, and the public input is the updates we expect to happen if those preconditions are true. So in other words, the proof is attesting to saying, like, given this, uh, this constraint system that was written for this smart contract, um, if you have these preconditions that are true on chain, then you can do these updates. That's what the proof is actually saying. And when this is submitted to the chain, the chain will make sure the preconditions hold, and only if the preconditions hold is the, the transaction actually going to be applied and the updates will happen. Um, and in fact, that's part of what's being encapsulated inside of these transaction proofs that are going in here because the network is taking all these updates and then it's proving the application of these updates to the ledger and that is going to make sure the preconditions hold. If preconditions don't hold, then you could not build a proof saying that the transaction was applied. And so to actually uh, combine all of this down into one proof, what we have to do is we have to recurse over all these transactions um, in the tree style of recursion that Florian was talking about before. So imagine that we have a series of transactions on the network. This board is just going to continue leaning, I think. You know, each of these transactions potentially has a proof attached to it, which came from the user who submitted it. And if you apply each of these transactions, you're going to progress through different ledger states. It's a, it's a linear sequence of applications we're gonna to do to ledger. And so they're each basically feeding into one another. And so we could think that we start with like ledger state one, we go to ledger state two, three, four, and five. And if you do tree-based recursion on this, what you do is if you merge these two transactions together, like I've proven this transaction in the snark circuit, I've proven this transaction in the snark circuit, and if I recurse over both of them, now I have a proof that there is some set of transactions that goes from ledger one to three, right? I, I basically compress the information about the fact that I transitioned from one to two to three. Now all I have is proof that says I went to one to three. And you do the same thing over here. Now I know that I can go from three to five. And you do that one more layer. And finally, you're left with a proof that says if I go to one to five, that is proven now, right? All the transactions have been proven. They're all merged together. And I have this big step ledger transition that I can now apply to the blockchain. Um, now in terms of actually making sure that you can compute all of this, it's unrealistic to have every single block producer compute all of those transaction proofs every single time we produce a block. But because this is tree-based recursion, you can actually do this in parallel, which means that if you can do it asynchronously, if you don't require each block producer to do all of these proofs, you can make this information available, this work basically available to a larger network of nodes, and then that larger network of nodes can work in parallel to basically produce all this work so that block producers can then purchase that work back from the network. And so, if 
you imagine sort of that tree-based recursion, right, if every single block was just building one tree, what you would notice is that uh, initially, when it creates this queue of transactions for that block, there would be four pieces of work available. But then once you complete those four pieces of work available, there's only two pieces of work and there's only one piece of work. So it creates sort of this like spiky fluctuation in the amount of work that's available in the network, but that's not actually what we want. And so what we can do is if we have multiple trees at once, and each tree we're working on different layers, okay, so you imagine like this tree right here, right now the whole network is working on the bottom layer. And this tree right here, the whole network is working on the middle layer, and this tree right here, it's only working on that top layer, right? If you combine all these together, that's basically just one tree, right? So you can keep on doing this, and what you have is a constant amount of work, a constant amount of parallel work that's available on the network, and so you constantly can, you can basically fully saturate the available of parallel work that is available, trying to recurse over all these proofs. Um, and, and that gives you the property that, you know, you don't have the spikiness, you don't have to have, like, the network spin up a whole bunch of nodes when there's, like, a whole bunch of transactions and then spin them down because there's no work to do. And so what happens on, on the chain is that if some block is adding, you know, some transactions to a tree, then over a few different ser series of blocks in the future, that tree is going to get slowly proven all the way up until a future block can then include the proof that gets emitted from the very top of that tree. Okay, that way we only have to, to verify one proof of transactions per blockchain proof. So the block producer, instead of having to do in proofs, only has to do one proof all the time. Um, and with the properties that we have, this is always a fixed size queue. So the, the size of the queue and the available space in the queue per block producer to actually insert transactions in here is never changing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, sequencing in detail, but I, I want to pause for a moment and see if there's any questions on any of this so far. Well, I mean, it's uh, blockchain, so there is uh, consensus to which has to be done to actually conform on which the which is the series of blocks that you know the network has agreed on. Um, but each of those, basically, you can think about this queue as being tied to a block, right? This queue is committed to by each block, so every block sort of projects a fixed size queue. And so, if the if the network is converging on one blockchain, um, then they'll sort of agree on what that fixed size queue is. Yeah. Well, that's that. Um, so that still kind of works the same way it does in other blockchains, in the sense that when the block producer is queuing the things inside of this queue, they're choosing the sequence. They're trying to find a valid sequence in which these can be applied together. And so, just like on Ethereum or something, when you basically choose a sequence of transactions that apply, you're doing the same thing here. It's just you're not proving it when you first like, sort of queue them to be applied. Thank you. I think that's true for account based, but for example, Zcash, like we don't care um, yeah. which or in which order um, you submit your proofs. Yeah, well, the, we do use an account based model though. Right, I see. Okay. Uh, yes, one last note on that um, topic is that, but then uh, could you just like quickly explain where are the transactions then stored because not it's not on the on the blockchain so where so a, a block is including the sequence of transactions that it wants to be proven um, so similar, similar to other blockchains it's just that you over time because you're building this proof you can kind of throw out the old blocks right so within the space of this queue that's happening on the network this is sort of all unproven territory these are included inside the blocks when you first mm -hmm. receive that block 
Um, so it, just the same as any other blockchain, we include the transactions in the sequence that we want them to be applied in. But then because we eventually recurse over them and then we sort of prove it, it at a certain point in time, we don't care about the history of it anymore. And we don't need to keep the old blocks. I just, I don't want to like, uh, like that, but just one last question. Is there not a risk of maybe some transactions like uh, getting lost if there is someone working on um, a version of the blockchain that basically does get overrides by another longer one and this transaction is basically not in the, like, or the transaction of the version that was just like overwritten, not included in the, in the new? So no. you're asking about reorgs? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, reorgs are possible in this. So the, the chain is equally susceptible as reorgs as mm -hmm. other chains are in the sure. sense that um, if one history of, of uh, the chain allowed some transaction to be applied, but the network then converged in a different history, it doesn't allow that transaction to be applied, and that mm -hmm. transaction could be lost. Um, we do have on-chain failure, so in a lot of cases that transaction will be included, but it just would be marked as failed. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? So um, I want to talk a little bit about sequencing. Maybe I don't have to diagram this so much, but I want to talk a little about how like the sequencing works in the L1 and why this is an interesting property. Florian already alluded to the concept of uh, using the L1 to sequence actions and then having an off-chain reducer go through and actually compress those transactions into a series of groups. Um, and what is interesting about this is because if you were to build like your own sequencer out of the box, you would either basically be stuck with the problem of being centralized right, because you have a central service and people are going to come send your transactions to and you're going to sequence them yourself. Or if you want to be decentralized, you're basically going to rebuild a blockchain in some extent. You're going to build some kind of consensus system, a distributed system, which you're going to kind of agree on what the set of states is so that you can have a shared sequence. The idea of having the actions be submitted directly to the L1 is that you can submit the actions for free, in a sense. You can submit them very cheaply because you're not generating a proof to submit the actions. Um, but you get to use the consensus mechanism of the L1 to have the network converge on the sequence that you want to commit to. And so then the reducer has this committed to sequence that is publicly committed to it, knows what the sequence is, the whole network agrees to it, sort of allows, it sort of allows you to just build this very simple off-chain reducer and get the decentralized sequencing aspect for free. And the way that that works is that on our blockchain, we have an a interesting permission model where you can basically specify different parts of your account state that are allowed to be updated and what permissions uh, you are required to basically authorize that update. And so what you can do is actions is essentially like an append only list that you can append information to. And when you uh, configure your smart contract, you can say that there is no authorization required to submit an action. And what that lets you do is any user can come in without having the proof without having the, the private key of that account, and they can just submit an action to that account if they want to, you know, if you so choose to design your smart contract this way. And then you offline, to actually uh, you know, consume that action, you would be generating the proofs that would consume the actions, and so you sort of, it's, you can think about it like a list, and you have like two indices. There's always like the head of the list. This is like what users are working on, is the head of the list, they're always appending to this. And perhaps the actual contract is sort of stuck back here, right? This is like our pointer to what we have consumed so far. And offline, the reducer can go through and consume actions up to the head of the list or some point in the list, and it can combine this all together into a single zero knowledge proof. Um, it can do this with tree-based recursion. It can do this with linear recursion. You really, it's up to you and your design of your reducer how you actually want to do this. Um, but you can generate this and you can sort of build these big step transitions or you can even do it small step. But the idea is that you can have people submit in actions, which are very cheap to submit um, and do not require any permissions to do. And then you can do one big proof to consume a whole bunch of those actions all at once after you've had the sequence agreed to on chain. Uh, how much time do I have left? Five, okay. Um, I'll open up for questions one more time and if there are no more questions, I can talk a little bit about the future talk a little about folding versus recursion, but yeah, I just want to see if there's any more questions real quick. Okay, um, so I'll talk a little bit about some exciting stuff in the future for our proof system, some things that we're researching right now, um, and sort of the exciting things that can happen with that. So we, we talked quite a bit about recursion and tree-based recursion. Um, tree-based recursion being this whole system by which you can have a series of proofs 
and you can do binary recursion over them to get out one proof at the end. Um, this has uh, computational cost to actually do this, right? If you have n proofs at the bottom, you have to do, uh, what's the math? It's like, if it's, if it's like, huh? Two, two n minus one, right? Yeah, it's, no, it's because it's, it has to do with the power. It's like some power of two, and then it's like two n plus one minus one, right? So if this was uh, two to the n transactions here, or two to the n proofs here, then the total amount of work that you have to do is two n plus one minus one, right? I'm pretty sure it's that. Anyway, the point is that you're basically incurring overhead to do all this work, right? There's a constant overhead that you have to take, and it's more than just doing two n pieces of work. But there's this new thing that's being worked on called folding, and what folding is, is folding lets you take n transactions and basically combine them in a way that you can amortize the cost of, verify, of generating this proof and combining them all together to just be one. It, it's not exactly one, but it amortizes the one, because what you can do is you can basically fold all the witnesses, all the public and private inputs for all these proofs together into a single set of witnesses, and then you can generate the proof once on that big set of witnesses. And so from this, we immediately get one proof out. Now, there's a difference between these two approaches because when you're doing the folding approach, there's a couple of constraints. First off, all of these proofs that you're folding together have to have the exact same shape. They have to have the exact same set of constraints. That's not actually true in this case. In this case, you can actually have a whole bunch of different circuits. You can do this trick called side-loaded verification keys where you're saying, hey, there exists some verification key and I'm gonna bring that in and now I'm gonna verify a proof against that. And so these can all have different shapes and you can merge them together in different ways. Whereas this one, they all have to have the same shape, but also you have to have all the private inputs to do this, right? If you already had these proofs generated, these proofs could already commit to private inputs offline and now you just have the proof that's attesting to the public inputs. Whereas here, to do this trick, you have to have both the private and public inputs. And so this sort of creates an interesting tension where uh, folding is much better for performance, whereas recursion is much better for generality or privacy. Um, what's cool about this is that there's nothing to say that you can't build a proof system that has both. And if you have a proof system that has both, it means that you can use the generality and the privacy that you get with recursion and use the proofs that you get out of there and then fold over them or you can then fold over proofs in a situation where you actually can have all the private inputs and you're interested in performance and they're all the same shape, and then you could use that as part of your recursion system. And so this is one of the big future things that we're looking towards in research, is finding a way to, we're, we're actively looking at implementing folding in our proof system, and then looking at ways to integrate this in our blockchain, and what that would allow you to do is, you could kind of avoid a lot of this, right? You could sort of do this in a much faster way. So instead of having to make the network do the uh, two to the n plus one minus one proofs that are required to combine two to the n proofs together, um, you can have the network amortize that to be one. And so you can really speed up the throughput of the network a lot like that. But then you can always fall back to this for off-chain use cases where you're having users give you private inputs or different use cases where you just don't know the shape of the proofs, right? So you, you get both techniques. You get the performance of folding in situations where you've already hidden the private inputs, users have already done their computation, and they're giving you something, and I'm saying now, oh, I have all these transactions I want to prove. But in the situation where you're like, oh, I have all these proofs, and I want big, one big proof that's tested all of them, but I don't know what they are, then you can still use this technique. Yeah, I guess that's my time, but um, if anybody has more questions, uh, please, you know, just come talk to me afterwards. Oh, okay, well, I was tricked by the timer. Yeah, does anybody have any questions?
interaction into a circuit. So, yeah, would you know anything about that effort? Um, I, I can't speak too much to that. I don't know if you have something that you can say about that, Brandon, but no. um, you're talking about lookup tables, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I know that that's something that is, you know, exists in the proof system today. In fact, actually, we had somebody working on a hackathon project recently, and we exposed it directly for them to work for the hackathon. So it is usable today in Kimchi. I, I believe the static lookup tables are fully exposed. The dynamic lookup tables are still um, not fully exposed, but they are implemented in the proof system. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Anything else? Cool. Well, thanks for coming to talk.